I'm Ken Rickward, and this is Mining Biblical Truth. It's great to be back with you this week to talk about these next chapters of 1 Samuel 21 through 24, which I'm calling Wilderness Wanderings. David enters a new phase of his life, going from the high point, uh, or at least the initial high point, of being the adopted prince of Israel to now being uh, hunted instead of honored. So let's go back and, and look at our chaotic structure uh, of the uh, books of Samuel. And we'll see that we are now in the first part uh, of chapters 21 through 31 which is the turning point, the reversal of fortunes, where Saul seeks to kill David, but instead, uh, at the end of that, Saul will be killed by the Philistines. And then we have another chiasm inside chapters 21 through 31. So let's take a look at that. Interestingly, at the center of this chiasm, we have the death of Samuel and the uh, scene with David and Abigail, which is uh, uh, kind of a fascinating uh, place to to center this uh, uh, this tale. Uh, women should appreciate this since uh, Abigail is a a voice of reason in David's life. On each side of that, we have the episodes where the Ziphites betray David. And David spares Saul's life. And these have a lot of very uh, clear uh, parallels in both that uh, David spares Saul and takes a token, and Saul recognizes David's voice. And then that's flanked by David saves Keilah from the Philistines, chapter 23, and David saves Judean towns from the Philistines by pretending to uh, attack them while attacking their enemies in chapter 27. And then at the beginning here, which we're looking at today, David flees and Saul has Yahweh's priest killed. Uh, at the end, we have uh, Yahweh has Saul and his so sons killed at Gilboa. David seeks help for the high priest at the beginning. Saul seeks help from the deceased Samuel via the auspices of a witch. <laughs> Quite the contrast. The priest gives David consecrated showbread in the beginning, and at the end, the witch feeds Saul. And then David uh, receives a sword he used to decap decapitate Goliath, and Saul is decapitated himself by swords of the Philistines. At the beginning, we have David dismissed from the presence of King Achish of Gath when he pretends to be crazy. And then David dismissed from the presence of King Achish, Achish again after his uh, sojourn there as a uh, mercenary, supposedly on the behalf of the Philistines. So at the beginning and end here, we see what I would call desperate acts of the flesh. Uh, first by David, and then by Saul. And then in parts of B and B prime, we have acts of faith guided by the Spirit involving David saving his people. And then we have the betrayal by the fearful people, people who cannot be trusted. And at the in the middle, uh, the Lord sends Abigail to save David. So I just wanted to point out here that the timeline is uh, approximately eight years, at least according to some sources, uh, between 1018 and 1010. Uh, however, the exact time in Ziklag varies depending on how you uh, interpret it. Uh, could be less than four years. Uh, but this uh, commentator uh, believes that it was a four-year period. Uh and so he spends four years hiding from Saul in Israel and four years hiding from Saul in Philistine territory.
before Saul dies. So our key question here is, are David's eight years in the wilderness wasted? When the Israelites were in the wilderness, they did a lot of complaining or murmuring, whispering doubts about God and Moses' leadership. David, a musician and man after God's own heart, turns to song to express his emotions. In an index of David's uh, Psalms uh, during the four-year period hiding from Saul in Israel, we have 10 uh, Psalms, which kind of blew me away, to be honest. <laughs> the um, And some of these are a little bit controversial, but most of them have a very clear association with these historic events. And... Uh, we'll come back to these here in a, uh, a few minutes. But the, the narrator of Samuel gives us little information about David's inner thoughts or emotions. So most of that information comes from David's Psalms. One of the key questions in the Psalms is, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? And I feel confident that all of us have uh, felt this question on our hearts at some point in our life. David's answer to this question is in his Psalms, where he answers with unwavering trust in God, honest expressions of feelings to God, and bold calls for God to be faithful. And all the while, we find him pointing to Christ. Expression through verse, rather than, why is expression through verse so much more powerful than prose? I came across a reference by the poet Shelley, who made the case that prioritizing the content of the message over the aesthetics of the message, uh, that is, how it was communicated, was a sign of decadence. The deepest truths of existence can only be communicated by appealing to the imagination via poetry. I think also that the imagination is stirred by visual images and music, and all the more powerful when poetic lyrics, music, and images are combined. Quoting Carl Truman from his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, quote, Content and form are bound together by their, co their common purpose, unquote, which is inspiring empathy. Teaching virtue requires that, quote, art must have a central role in the moral transformation of humanity, unquote. <clears throat> in order to engage the intellect, one must first engage the emotions and ignite the imagination. Therefore, the expression of David's emotions in the Psalms is more powerful than it would be in prose given by a narrator. Andrew Fletcher, a Scottish political activist, said, let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes this laws. Indicating that the songs would be a more uh, guidance to the people or inspiring. <clears throat> but in combining those, Mark Twain, in his non Christian worldview goal, said, Let me make the superstitions of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws or its songs either. Now that's going to be apropos when Saul goes to visit the witch uh, because of his superstitions. I think that uh, uh, Twain would have been comfortable as a, uh, a jester and influencer in Saul's court. Believing superstitions, if those in power can make you fear, then they can control your attitude and behavior. Twain, an atheist, visited the Holy Land and found it to be a disgusting wasteland. But it only appeared to be a wasteland because Twain was dwelling in spiritual darkness. 
So a brief glimpse of David's emotions is found in these 10 Psalms. And as you see here, the, the numbering of the Psalms is, is erratic, uh, non-chronological, and that's because they've been collected in a thematic manner or, or in a thematic, with a, th a thematic goal in mind by the collector. So what we're going to do is, is go through these very, very uh, superficially, uh, kind of like a 30,000 foot uh, journey uh, through uh, 10 Psalms to pick out some highlights of David's emotions. Starting with Psalm 7, verse 9, the context here is he's fleeing from Saul, and it's a plea for the righteous. He says, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. The one who examines the thoughts and emotions uh, is a righteous God. In Psalm 59, 11, and 12, the context is Saul's agents wait for him outside his home. He says, slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by their, thy power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying, which they speak. So David desires that his enemies be held accountable. And then in Psalm 56, we have the context of being recognized in Gath, <laughs> hearing Goliath's sword of all things. And in verse 8, uh, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. And in verse 14, I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? Paul later will say much the same thing. David is trusting that God is in control. And that he sees his tears, that God has empathy. And in Psalm 34, context here is acting crazy in Gath. He says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. So even though he had a method to be freed, he was relying on the Lord. And further in that Psalm, verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. So trust and be heard by God. And then we come to Psalm 52. The context here is Doeg wipes out Nob. Verse 7, lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthen himself in his wickedness. But in verse 8, he says, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. These are the contrasting ways of the wicked and the righteous, continuing that theme. And then Psalm 63. Now he's in the dry wilderness. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. So in times of trouble, remembering how God has been faithful brings us joy. And in Psalm 54, context is betrayal by the Ziphites. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life not the people. It was Saul who relied on the people, relied on his popularity rather than his relationship with God. To be on God's side is to be in the camp of righteousness, trust in God, not in people. And in Psalm 22, he's surrounded by Saul in Moa. When? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance, 
are the words of my groaning. And of course, that reminds us of Jesus on the cross. Surrounded like Jesus on the cross, David prophecies about Jesus. Further prophecy in verse 6, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. In 7 and 8, All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads and say, He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Well, the Lord does rescue both David and Jesus. And in verse 12, many bulls have encompassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. These strong bulls of Bashan is a reference to the evil forces. Bashan being the um, mountain area of the kingdom of Og. In verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. That certainly expresses emotions. <laughs> and then verse uh, Psalm 18, the context is David delivered from Saul. Where he says, Lord, you are faithful to those who are faithful. You are good to those who are good. You never do wrong to those who have done no wrong but you outsmart the wicked, no matter how clever they are. And in Psalm 142, in the, in the cave, cave at En Gedi, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path and the way in which I walk. They have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge my portion in the land of the living. Like D David, Jesus made the Father his refuge. In Psalm 57, again in the cave at Gedi, I call to God most high. He reaches down and saves me, sending his faithful love, while I am surrounded by lions. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. They dug a pit for me, but they fell into it. I will sing praises to you among the nations. David here is not just, I think, referring to the lions of Saul and his men, but also David's own men who tried to persuade him to kill Saul. They're just as much a threat as Saul is. The themes here are spiritual warfare. It's the righteous versus the wicked. All are accountable to the Lord. Trusting in God's control and his empathy, freedom from fear, resting in the Lord, and the spiritual king worthy of all praise. So God provides for David in the wilderness. He provides a prophet, Gad, a priest with an ephod, Uman and Thuman, and Abiathar to help guide David, and a ragtag group of outcasts to mold into mighty men. Jesus did much the same thing, like this painting by James Tassad of David's mighty men. But they did not begin as mighty. They were transformed by godly spiritual leadership. Just like uh, God, David does it. God picks the wicked, the wicked, the, the weak, excuse me, and the weak are attracted to David, the disenfranchised. And this, uh, uh, just for fun, reminds me of the tale of Robin Hood, which is probably partially true, at least. It seems to be very much patterned after this story of David. Let's look at the parallels. Well, we have Robin and David, of course, and then we have King John and King Saul, the protagonist. We have the hero of the crusade against Islam, uh, 
in uh, Robin and the hero of the battle with the Philistines in David. Both are honorable. Both are of high social status. Both are declared fugitives and attract outcasts. Their weapons are somewhat similar, the bow versus the an arrow versus the sling. Although David does write the song of the bow to honor Jonathan. Robin slays her guy. David slays Goliath. You have the merry men versus the mighty men. <laughs> you have the best friends. Uh, the best friend of Robin was Little John. And for David, Jonathan. And then the key women in the tale are both have a name starting with M, Marion and uh, Macau. Uh, and the evil king attempts to use them unsuccessfully. Both Robin and David are singers. They both have spiritual sidekicks, Friar Tuck and Abiathar. Neither were perfect. Robin was a thief. David was a liar, adulterer, and murderer. And both hid in the wilderness. And both were confident of final vindication, of overcoming evil with good. So here we see confidence in the cross. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 3.14. And confidence was what powered David. Then we have the dark results of ignoring the cross. There's the school of hard knocks. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And Albert Einstein said, there is only one road to human greatness through the school of hard knocks. But faith enables us to endure. I thought this diploma was funny. The regents of the School of Hard Knocks hereby confer upon you, having demonstrated extraordinary resilience in the face of adversity, this master's degree in crap nobody should ever have to deal with. <laughs> well, we all felt deserving of this diploma at one point or another. So we live in dangerous times at least as dangerous as the times of David's wanderings, maybe more so if we are entering the end times. Therefore, we must be spiritually armed, ready for spiritual war. Like Robin's merry men, you should be filled with joy because you have placed Jesus over you. So how ready are you for the wilderness? How will you find joy while fleeing evil? Dear Lord, thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for these uh, wonderful uh, lessons in trusting you uh, and following your guidance of persevering through hardship and never relinquishing our joy never taking your eyes off Christ who has saved us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As usual, please share with a, a friend. Uh, click like, make a comment on YouTube, or communicate with us at info at biblemining.org. The PDF of this presentation is or will be available on our website. Thanks for watching and have a blessed week.